Okay. So, what do we have questions on? What ones do we want to go over? Yes. Come on up here. <laughs> Come on up here and see what you're doing. <laughs> okay, so you had a question. Which one? Yes. This first page is done. It's actually done. Okay, so which one are we on? Okay, seven. Okay, so seven. Okay, so this one right here, it's a story problem. I hate story problems. I told you what I do with story problems. So as I read it, I write it down. So if this, that's a number. Okay, we're going to fix my board real quick because it's not doing what it's supposed to do. That would be a good idea. Okay, let's try again. There we go. All right, so that is either Q or I can call it delta H. Either one works. It's 1,225 calories. The next thing I come up is heat is added, so it's going to be endothermic. Maybe I need that, maybe I don't. There's a mass, so I'm going to take mass equals 25.0 grams. Coming across at room temperature, and here's the temperature. So I know that's a T. I don't know what, oh, there's a final temperature, so it must be temperature initial is 25 degrees. Final temperature, we don't know, TF, question mark. The specific heat is this. So I'm going to go, okay, CP is 2.44 joules per gram Kelvin. Now the first thing I need to look at is, are all my units compatible? Well, I've got calories and I've got joules, so I've got to convert one of them into the other. So this is a problem that will be like one on the test, so make sure the units are compatible. So I'm going to convert the top one because it's just one unit, I don't have to mess with a whole bunch, yeah? No, ask. Okay, Q is the amount of energy, so it's like the same as delta H. So remember when we did endo exo, that was the difference between the products and the reactants, that's delta H. Okay, and then M is mass. Mm -hmm. T is temperature. temperature. So TI is temperature initial, TF is temperature final. And then CP? CP is specific heat, don't know why they called it CP and not SP oh, so or something. What's specific heat is in How much energy it energy. takes to raise one, one, a, one gram substance of that one degree Celsius. And degree Celsius and degree Kelvin have the same integral. So when they say here Kelvin, right here, it could actually be Celsius. Okay, so I'm just taking that as Kelvin Celsius is the same because it's how much for one degree. And the degree integrals or, or differences are the same in the Kelvin and Celsius scale. And they're not in the Fahrenheit. Okay. All right, so the first thing I do is say, oh, I've got calories, I've got joules. I've got to be in the same unit. doesn't matter if I convert this one from joules to calories or this one from calories to joules. What do you need? I just want to know if you know where bad light is. No. Prison. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> to prism. Oh, prism. Yeah, well, that's what you're supposed to hear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first thing I want to do is convert this. This is the one conversion that we said at the very first. One calorie is equal to 4.184 grams, or sorry, joules. So one calorie, 4.184 joules. So calories here are going to go out. So I'm just converting, just getting them all in the same units. And that was one of the conversions I said. If I didn't remember, I would put it on my 3 by 5 card. Okay, we should end up with 5,000 something, I think. Okay. So have you got both of them? Three? Yep, so save it and you're good to go. 5,000, one more time. And that would be joules. Ah, let me drink right down. Okay, so now I've got everything in units I can use. 
So then I say, okay, well, I know Q equals MCP delta T. And I also know that um, the delta T is equal to temperature final minus temperature initial. I like to do these in two steps because I don't like to do distributive property. Temperature final minus temperature initial. Right. Right. Okay, so now I'm just going to plug in what I need, but I've got to solve for Tf, or T, delta T here. So because I'm solving for delta T, all I do is move everything else onto the other side, and I have to divide it. So delta T, I'm just using math, dividing both sides by MCP. Q is always going to be on top, so if I have to solve for any one of those three, Q is always on the top. Everything else is on the bottom that I don't want to find. So MCP is here, and I just plug in. So Q, 5,125.4 joules divided by mass, 25 grams, times by the specific heat, 2.44 joules per gram degrees Celsius, because Celsius and Kelvin are the same, basically, here as far as integrals. So grams go out, joules go out. I'm left with degrees Celsius. But remember, when you do this in your calculator, you got to hit the divide, and then you got to have parentheses around those. So what do we get for delta T? Okay, and since I looked up here, um, temperature was only to the ones, that's all I need is 84. So 84 degrees, and that's equal to delta T, right? That's not what they asked, though. They wanted the final temperature, right? So now I'm going to use this equation, and I'm trying to find that, right? So I'm going to do what math does, and they add Ti to both sides, or temperature initial to both sides. So Tf becomes delta T plus Ti. So I'm plugging in delta T was 84 degrees, Ti was 25 degrees, and I end up with 109 degrees Celsius as my final temperature. Okay? So this one was probably one of the more hard ones when she asks you for final temperature, initial temperature, but if you break it down into two steps, it makes it easier. Okay, I could have put um, that Tf minus Ti in for delta T into that original equation, but then I have to do use the distribution property and it gets a little hairy and I don't like it. So that's the way I do it. Any questions? Did you follow me all the way through? Know how to do it. Okay, what do you want to do next? Eight. Okay, so one would need, and this doesn't roll up with me, so I'll have to erase it. Okay, so one would need to add how many calories? So what is that? What is calories? What, what, right? What, what, um, what letter does it represent? What is calories? Q, Q. And, and you just did the, the one that everybody does. They think CP. Specific is CP. That was the one that has lots of units. Just remember CP has lots of units. Q or delta H has just one unit. It's calories or, or joules. So I'm trying to find this one. Okay? Increase the temperature. So if I increase the temperature, I'm endothermic and I am, that is a mass. So 145.6 grams of ethanol. Ooh, here's the change in temperature. So this was TI or initial temperature. This is TF. Remember, delta T is the final temperature minus the initial temperature, so 77 minus 10 will give me 67 degrees for my delta T. And then it gives me the specific heat, that's that CP, and it's 0 0.583 calories per gram degrees Celsius. Okay, check on units. Are we okay on units?
Right. Okay, now what do I do? Yeah, well, it's a formula. And we've got everything, so we just plug it in. Plug and chug. Excuse me for just a second. So what'd you get? Okay, next one. Do you have specific ones you guys want to go through? Okay. All of them are all of them are in order on the on the um, web, so you can go up to Canvas and you can pick what one in order you want to go through. If you want to go through a specific one, yes. Twenty one. Okay, 21. Wait, 14, because you're passing all the way down. Okay, 14. Okay, so this one you're actually looking at London dispersion forces, which we call LDFs, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. Okay, so the first thing you look at is which one doesn't have uh, well, which one has hydrogen bonding? Does any of them have hydrogen bonding? Yeah, all of them. Careful. Hydrogen bonding is when nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine is directly connected to a hydrogen. That's hydrogen bonding. Which one has hydrogen bonding? The first one, and the third one. Oh, Okay, so that one has hydrogen bonding. Okay. Which one of these are polar? So basically, if it's not symmetrical, and I can slice it or get one side being this negative, one side being positive. Okay, the third one is has a dipole. So if I look at it, this side's more negative, this side's more positive. So that's dipole, dipole. I'm just going to go DD. Okay, what about this one? Th this one that has a hydrogen bonding. It actually has a dipole too, but a little one. The hydrogen bonding is more important. Okay, so we're going to ignore that. What are the other one? What about this one? Does it have a dipole? No. I can't cut the oxygen away, right? It's stuck in the middle. So there's no dipole here. Dipole means can I make it a positive and a negative side? On this one, I can't make it a positive or a negative side, right? What about this one? Is it positive or negative side? No. OK, so those are London dispersion. So they're going to be my LDFs. 
London Dispersion Forces. Oh, I thought you said LDS. I wrote down LDS. <laughs> no, not LDS. LDF. <laughs> okay, so LDFs get stronger the more electrons we have on it. So the more weight we have, that means we have more neutrons and protons and more electrons, right? So as I'm looking at that, this one only has two carbons, right? This one has two carbons and an oxygen along with the hydrogens. Hydrogens are like ones. They're like little gnats. So I'm going, okay, this one's about 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. It's about 30 electrons that are running around. Just, it's really not, but I'm just going to pretend. Okay, this one right here, I've got 24 plus I've got 16. That's what, 40? 24 and 16, I think 40. Basically 46, right? So this one right here, since it's lighter weight and it doesn't have as many electrons and it doesn't have as many to make it have a positive side and a negative side by electrons getting on one side of the atom or the other, this one's going to have the lowest boiling point and melting point. Okay? Which one do you think is going to have the highest? Right, so this one right here, because the hydrogen bonding is going to be the highest melting point and boiling point. So this one's the lowest. That one's the highest. Which one would go, how do they go in between them? Sorry, forgot my alarms are still set on. That's for me to go home, but I'm staying. <laughs> okay, so the ones in between, this one only has LDFs, but it's, it's got a high amount of electrons that can be shifted. This one has a very low number, but it is polar. So they're probably not going to ask you to range them for you, but since this one has dipole, dipole, it will stay in more. Okay. Um, the one right here is an ether. Does anybody know what an ether was used for? Putting people out, knocking you out, like chloroform is an ether. Okay, so it's always a gas at room temperature. This one right here is formaldehyde, and it's actually a liquid at room temperature. So the strongest force is, so as we go, all of these have London dispersion forces, all of them. So these all have LDFs. That's the lowest force there ever is. That they all have LDFs. Okay? But it's asking here, what's the strongest intermolecular forces in each of them? That's what we were doing. So this one's hydrogen bonding. This one only has LDF, so that's the highest. This one's dipole, dipole. And this one only has London dispersion. So the strongest one was the hydrogen? So what is the strongest intermolecular forces in each of the ones? So you'd have to say hydrogen bonding, LDF. Dipole, dipole, LDF. Okay, we ready to move on to another one? If you guys have one that you get to that you need a question, just jump in. Okay. Okay, where are we going next? 21? Is there a specific one you want to do? 21? Okay. So again, as you're going through these, make sure that you're pulling out as you get them. So, I, like I said, you've seen me. I underline it, I put it down. I underline it, put it down. So, let's change colors. <laughs> 5.2, that's a volume. So I put volume 1 is equal to 5.2 liters. Even if I only end up with one volume and I'm using the ideal gas law, I still put V1, P1, whatever I get to it. Okay, of a gas is this. So that's the initial temperature. So T1 equals 215K. How nice of it to be in Kelvin. It won't always be. So at this point, if you gave it to Celsius, I would stop. I would add 273.515 and I would get to Kelvin. Okay, gas laws have to be in Kelvin. Specific heat laws do not. That was what we were using. Yeah, I know. So we're using two of them. Specific heat laws can be in, in Celsius, but gas laws can't. Gas laws always have to be in, in well, Kelvin. Well, like It'll be just like this. So as you're coming down, if you're getting volume, if you're getting temperature, you know right away. Are you getting pressure? That's not in specific heat. Well, what did we have in specific heat? We had mass, 
we had well we had a change in temperature so there's got to be a change and we had specific heat or or yeah so we had some specific heat or we had something like that given just remember they're two separate things but they're in the same chapter so that makes it rough okay so then we get to the next one heated to T2 545 K at constant pressure whose law constant pressure Charles law so that's going to be V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2 okay what volume does the gas occupy now so I'm looking for V2 okay so I've got my equation here I circle what I'm looking for that's just what I used I do okay I circle what I'm looking for I want to get it on its own so that means if it's on the bottom, it's going to times to the top on the other side. If it's on top, it's going to go to the bottom, you know, kind of thing. So I'm going to have V2 is equal to V1 T2 divided by T1. See how I rearranged it? Everybody okay with that? Now just plug in. Make sure you're plugging the right things in, though. So 5.2 liters times T2. 545 Kelvin divided by T1 215K Can temperature in Kelvin cancels out and we're ending up with liters which we should because it's a volume right times the 2 divide by that we ended up with we should have two significant figures because of the 5.2 13 liters is what we should end up with yes done Okay, pick another one. Pick another one if you want to go to, through another one. And like I said, all of these are up on, on, the, on the web, on your canvas. So if you get home and you're going, ah, I need to do this one. Okay. Yes. 24. Okay, so a birthday balloon contains a helium pressure of, so here's a pressure one, 715 torr. What is the pressure expressed in millimeters mercury? <laughs> this one's a trick one. Remember I told you you need to write down that one atmosphere is equal to, yeah, this is one of them. So guess what? There's 760 torr is equal to 760 millimeters mercury. Tor cancels, millimeters mercury cancel, 715 millimeters mercury. Done. Now if it was, if I did PSI, I'd have to change through the PSI. Um, Tor and millimeters mercury are actually the exact same. Tor was the one that discovered how to measure pressure in millimeters mercury. So he was honored by calling it that unit. Mm -hmm. So on 23 going through, a sample of argon gas has a volume of V1 15.0 milliliters and a pressure of P1 0 0.50 atmospheres. Exerted, what pressure is exerted? So I'm looking for P2. If the volume is increased to V2, 50.0 milliliters at constant temperature. So what law? Um, boils. So what is Boyle's law? P1, V1 equals P2, V2. That sounds like R2-D2. Okay, again, I circle what I'm looking for. I want everything else to get on the other side. So I'm going to divide both sides by V2. So P2 is equal to P1V1 divided by V2. And then it's just a matter of plugging in. Check my units, make sure they cancel, and they do. So P1 is 0 0.50 atmospheres times volume 1, 15.0 milliliters, divided by V2, 50.0 milliliters, milliliters cancel, and we get our answer. 
and it should be zero point something ATM. Zero point one five. We're done. So even though this is a multiple choice test, I would personally have a lot of scratch paper because I like writing things out. Uh huh. All your tests are multiple choice. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Eighteen. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole packet's already done up on, on online. So if there's ones that you really need to. Eighteen. Yes or no? Okay. I was like, are we kidding about eighteen, or we want really eighteen? Okay. Which balloon at STP will contain the greatest number of gas particles? This is a trick question. Why? So they're different chemical formulas. Would it be hydrogen? But it's one mole of each. What does one mole mean? Avogadro's number of particles are in each one. So 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles of hydrogen or oxygen or nitrogen. So if they ask, do they have different number of particles and they're all one mole, they all have the same. If they ask the mass, then it's different. So this one, they're all the same. If they, had, if they had asked which one had the greater mass, what one would you ask? Answer. Oxygen, because it has 16 times 2, which is 32, where nitrogen just has 28, and hydrogen just has 2. OK, so really be careful with that one. OK, really be careful with that one. So look at like number of particles and mass of particles. Right. So be careful there. And be careful if they change the number of moles, that's going to change it too. So if they said one, two, three moles, so one, two, three, it would be the one with three moles that had the greatest number of particles. Okay? All right, which one? That's it. Woohoo! Yes, Megan. All right, awesome. Okay, so let's go back to six. I think we did that one already, but we'll do it again. I don't remember if we did it during tutorial or if we did it after school, this one. Okay, so for me, when she gives you this problem, pick the easiest things that you know how to eliminate first, which are what? Elements. Elements. So let's pick the elements. So which one are the elements? Uh, A, G. Okay. Okay. So remember also that brown hifkel, if they give you an N2 or an O2, it's still an element. OK, so we have potassium, Au, and S8. OK, now the next thing I do, I choose ionic, because those are the ones that are far apart on the periodic table. So there are two things that are far apart on the periodic table, not including hydrogen, because hydrogen plays tricks and goes by fluorine. OK, yes? Right. Right? And, I don't know, SIO2 and SIC4. But those two are close together, so they're not. Which one? Are SI and O, if you look on the periodic table, they're close. And SI and C are also close. So because they're close, they would be networks. So they would be what we call molecular, but careful. We'll, we'll do both here. Co this, remember when we talked about covalent? Covalent and molecular are the same. Covalent means close together. The problem is she put both network and covalent. So you've got to now distinguish between which ones will bond and make networks or like spider webs and which ones will just hang together just as their pair and they're not connected together. Okay? So these you sort of have to memorize or you need to write down on your card. So network solids are like graphite. And that's because graphite makes sheets of carbon like this that connect together, and they make a sheet like this, that, that, and they slide, so they are slippery. So because they network in the sheet, that is a network 
um, one. So that one is gra glass is that is actually SiO2. So that's actually on there twice. And diamond would be two, right? Uh-huh. And diamond does. Diamond does a 3D. And it actually looks like this. And it just keeps going. So then it hooks up like this. And then just keeps going out and out. And it makes a very strong molecule. So diamond is on there. Um, glass is also on there. We got that. Um, SiC4 is also on there and that's silicon carbide and if you look at it it's still got this structure going on okay so you got to think of the ones that were sort of go like that then what's left over is things like this that have weird things and you're thinking I don't know how this goes together that goes under here okay Carbon dioxide would go under there if we had carbon dioxide. Um, nitrogen dioxide would go under there. Yes. Amorphous. Um, yes, you could you could call that network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So metallic would just be something that is in the S, the D, the F, or the lower P. So like a copper, zinc, or a vanadium chromium okay sorry no that's just an alarm We're okay all right any others yes Samia. so how can we tell like so when it's endothermic heat is being added and it feels cold to the touch okay and then exothermic feels heat is being removed but it feels warm to the touch right because heat is leaving the system so then sublimation would be endo because it's going from a solid to a gas, right? Solid to a gas, I have to put energy in to get it up to the gas. And then melting would be XO? Mm -hmm. No, melting would be endo. Because I'm melting something, I'm taking something from a solid to a liquid, right? If I was freezing, it would be XO, because it would be losing heat to become colder. So then boiling? Boiling is endo, because I have to put energy in to get it to boil. So if I put, have to put energy in to make it happen, that's endo. If it gives off energy and becomes colder, then it's exo. Okay, but it feels hot. I know it's sort of backwards. What is deposition? Deposition is where you take a gas and you make it a solid. So it's opposite of sublimation. So it's depositing something. Yes. Number 17, yes. Okay, consider the balanced equation. So this is stoichiometry, okay? So we're gonna start with what we're given, which is this, of this, so 7.89 grams of magnesium. I know before I need to do anything with it, it has to be in moles. So I look on the periodic table and I say, oh, in one mole of magnesium, there are 24.305, I think that's right, double check, yep grams of magnesium and then I can cancel that out the big thing here is the STP because it's a standard temperature and pressure um, if you look at the mole maps around my room going down from the mole we can just use 22.4 it's Avogadro's law so one mole at STP any mole at STP is 22.4 liters so we just use one more conversion here and say okay one mole of magnesium at STP is 22.4 liter. Oh, sorry, we need to go. Magnesium is not going to make a volume. We need to first change to, because we're going to H2. We're trying to get here. So we're doing the stoke first. We're using the balanced equation. It's a one to one, right? So there's really nothing much to do here. One mole magnesium gives me one mole of hydrogen, moles of magnesium cancel. I'm now in hydrogen, now I can use that one mole. One mole of H2, 22.4 liters of H2. So basically, 7.89 times 22.4 divided by 
0.305 and we should be just six ish I'm guessing it might be back to seven it's what 7.27 liters of H2 and that was just lucky that was just me pulling numbers out of the hat that happened to work there okay did you have another question McKay no you're good I just I want I don't want to it not include you since you're far away okay any others that you'd like to go over how do I know? Number 15? 13. Okay, let's go there. That didn't want to go that way this time. This one? Okay. So consider the two liquids, A and B, in closed containers, which has a lower vapor pressure. Lower vapor pressure means I have not been able to get out of the liquid. So it has to be A. So this one has a lower vapor pressure, but it also has a higher um, intermolecular bonding. So it either has, whoops, I can't spell bonding. So it either has heavier molecules or it has hydrogen bonding, or it has dipole-dipole that the other one does not. Not necessarily thicker, but remember we had this right here. This would be represented by this, and this could be represented by this. So this one had hydrogen bonding that will hold it together. It's like best friends, right? So best friends, we're sticking together, and we're not going to kick anybody out. We're, we have a lot of energy, we hang together. This one right here is like another person gets added to the class, and they don't know anybody, and it's okay if we trade another class, and they just move out. Okay? So that farther one has lower intermolecular bonding, but it has a, a higher vapor pressure. Okay? Yes. When we're getting like, I don't know, our number 12. Number 12. Okay. Okay, the easiest thing to do with number 12 is you know all of them all have LDFs. Every single, every, every single one does. Dipole dipole means can I get it? So it has a positive and negative side. So I have two molecules. If I have two elements and they're both different and they're together, I'm going to have a dipole. So I'm looking at this. Oh, HBr. Yep, I'm going to have a dipole. Ooh, CH4. If I look at carbon, carbon's um, Lewis dot was this, right? And I put in my hydrogens here and here and here and here. I can't cut that carbon away. So this one doesn't have a dipole. Then I go to the next one, I say, okay, nitrogen. Nitrogen had two in the S and one in each of the P's. And then I come and I put my hydrogens in here, here, and here. It sort of looks like I can't cut it away, but I've got to be careful. Because remember, this is an unshared pair of electrons. What do they do? They pull it out of the, out of the plane, so I end up with N up here and the H's down like this, and so I can cut it. So that one is a dipole. Well, phosphorus is in the same family, so I could replace that, that um, N with a P, and it'd be the exact same. Then I look at Ki. Dipole, dipole, or not? Yeah, two different elements. Okay, what about CO2? Well, looking at that again, carbon had four around it, right? Oxygen has six, right? So it can share two here with carbon, share two here with carbon, and then another oxygen comes around. And it can share two here and two here. So if I rewrite that, it's basically O double bound C double bound O with extra four electrons that aren't shared. 
Can I cut the C away from the O's with one line? I can. It's in a line. So that's not going to be. Okay, let's go to the next one. Well, that one just wanted to go around with me. Phosphorus, that was this again. It's just like nitrogen. Well, this one, since it's with five, each of those are going to come to a chlorine, right? And it actually forms a shape like this. So there, in a plane, there's chlorines around the phosphorus in the center, and there's a chlorine up and there's a chlorine down. There's no way I can split that. Can't get that phosphorus away from those chlorines. They're surrounded. So that's not polar. Well, let's look at the next one. So you do need to remember, whoa, hello. Okay, you do need to remember your, your Lewis dot. So let's look at sulfur. Sulfur had one, two, three, four, five, six around it. So we have one oxygen that's going to come in, and that oxygen will bind these two. And then we've got one more oxygen that will come in, and it needs to, so it's going to share two in a, in a coordinate covalent bond right here. As I'm looking at this, this sort of looks a little bent. And if I can really sort of slice that S away from those O's. If I draw it a little bit differently, it might help. We have a double bound oxygen, single bound oxygen. It's in a triangle. I can split it. So that one is got a dipole dipole. When it gets to these hairy ones like this, okay, you just say it's got London dispersion forces. Don't worry about the rest. Unless they give you a drawing, then you've got to, you've got to be able to say, oh, it has a whatever. So now, the last one is what everyone stresses over, and I think it's the easiest, because all you're looking for is a nitrogen connected to a hydrogen, an oxygen connected to a hydrogen, or a fluorine connected to a hydrogen. First one, no. Second one, no. Third one, yes. You're on your way, huh? <laughs> hey, you What'd you do with all the guys? <laughs> Scared them away. That was bad. <laughs> okay, going through the rest of them. <laughs> Phosphorus and hydrogen, no. No, 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 no. So the only one that had hydrogen bonding was ammonia. Okay. Yep, NOF, that top row. Okay. Any others? Directly connected to a hydrogen, yep. Okay, any others? I've got about 15 more minutes before I need to leave to that meeting, so. Yes, we can. Okay, this is Dalton's Dell Law, and I can see right away before I even read it very far. How do I know it's going to be Dalton's Dell Law? It's a elements. Yeah, just the elements. It just says a sample of gases contains four gases. Boo, 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 boo. I know right away it's going to be Dalton's Dell Law. What's Dalton's Dell Law? Yeah, the total is going to be equal to all of them added up. That's Dalton's Dell Law. So it's basically. Pressure total is equal to the pressure of helium plus the pressure of neon plus the pressure of argon plus the pressure of xenon. Okay, so what do I have? I have the pressure of helium being 743. I'm going to use the units at the very end, millimeters mercury, because I hate to re keep redoing it. Plus, yes? Dalton. Dalton's Della. Okay, I don't have neon, so I'm going to just put pressure neon here, plus 635, plus 211, and it adds up to 
2,355. So how do I solve for that? Well, you're going to subtract it, right? So you would take, to find the pressure of neon, you would take 235, yeah, this number, minus all these others added together. Right? So Dalton's law, Del law. All the little parts add up to the whole. What do we get for pressure of neon? Seven sixty-six maybe millimeters mercury. Put the unit on it back at the end. because you're just taking each other's. <laughs> I want to see what you did. I want to see what you did. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, on question five on the front page, uh -huh. it says where, the boiling, where in the cooling curve the boiling um, occurred. Would it be B or W? Or where would boiling occur? Yeah. So, so it's the highest flat area. These are these numbers. So whichever you decided, whichever one you decided got the right thing. Uh -huh. So, so, yeah. So remember, you're doing the square root of the opposite. So if it's this over this, then this is going to be the the distance of that of this. So. So right here, all you're doing is, if I had twice as much mass of the MA, so MA, if I had twice as much of this one on the bottom, so in your, in your regular equation, so if I had the square root of MA, um, the gas miles of MBA B, so the B up here would be 2, mm -hmm. two MA divided by MA, so MAs would cancel. You'd end up with a square root of 2, which is not 1 half. Yes? Number 4. Okay, so this first, the lowest flat point, that is your melting point. That's just by definition. Okay, the lowest flat point is melting. The higher flat point is boiling. Or condensation and freezing. Depends on which way you're going. So if I'm going... So if I'm going from E to D, it's, condi it's con condi condi condensing, yes. It's a condensing. If I'm going from C to B, then it's freezing. If I'm going from B to C, it's melting. If I'm going from D to E, it's boiling. It just depends on the direction I'm going. Just the direction. Okay. And cooling curve is just reversed. It's still the same thing. So this would still be, this would be W to X would be condensing, X to W would be boiling. Okay? Any others? Just remember, if you get home and you want to go through any of these, they're up on your canvas, and you can go through any of them. Sounds like Megan already did. Okay, make sure your homework and your Learn Smarts are done before Wednesday. Lab will do we do Friday, so you have a little bit of stress relief. So you make sure you study good for the test. Because we came down on the lab a little bit strong. Are we done?
Okay, I'll put these two um, reviews also up there. So if you want to look at them, 